Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Maynooth University. I'm John O'Brennan, and it's a pleasure this afternoon on behalf of the Department of Sociology and the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute to host this special second event on the far right in Europe. Some of you who tuned in last week may have seen the seminar, the excellent seminar we did, which focused on Ireland and the far right in this jurisdiction. And today we broaden the lens, so, so to speak, to examine European perspectives on uh, the far right and how uh, that uh, threat is being confronted across multiple jurisdictions. Just to remind you that today's event is being recorded and we're also streaming live on Facebook. Um, just to say something about the sequencing of today's event, I'm going to uh, introduce each speaker as they come and each speaker is going to say something about their own specialization, their own background and why they engage particularly with this topic. But the greater part of our session today will be a conversation and that will allow us, I hope, to explore a wide, wide range of issues across multiple jurisdictions uh, and commonalities. Um, I should also point out that this session is supported by the Irish Research Council thanks to my colleague, Dr. Barry Cannon, the Department of Sociology, who oversees this award uh, in conjunction with Crosscare. Um, now to the first of our four speakers uh, this afternoon. Dr. Anna Kerstova is the founder and director of the Center for European Refugees, Migration and Ethnic Studies in Bulgaria. Uh, Anna is also a professor at the Department of Political Science at the New Bulgarian University in Sofia. And she has published very extensively on uh, topics related to migration, citizenship, uh, refugees and refugee politics and policies, far right populism and civic mobilizations. She is the co-editor with Bertie Sim and Aino Saarinen of Citizens, Activism and Solidarity Movements Contending with Populism, published by Palgrave in 2019, the latest of uh, quite a number of monographs that Anna has published. She's also the editor of Southeastern European Politics, which I know her uh, better from. So Anna, it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. I know that you're coming to us today live from Sarajevo. Um, and perhaps in introducing yourself, you would say something about the work that you do in Bulgaria and beyond. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure joining uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, uh, yeah, just to mention, uh, 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 let's say, my, my link, uh, let's say, to this problematic. So we had a few years ago a big uh, project on populism. Uh, and uh, we produced three books. We promised to the commission one, but uh, there was uh, so much, uh, let's say, to, to, to write. And uh, after those three books, we, uh, we uh, after the end of the project, we said we could not uh, uh, simply write on populism. We had to write also on uh, civic activism, uh, countering populism. And that's why we conceived the book. I, I had the pleasure to co, to co edit Routledge a book on uh, um, yeah, the civic activism against uh, far right. Uh, uh, so far right uh, uh, civic activism, uh, which I conceptualize in terms of uh, um, citizenship uh, and uh, migration are, let's say, the three pillars of uh, my research and uh, uh, teaching. I'm currently at the defenses of an international MA and on democracy and human rights. And uh, so glad, uh, let's say, to see some of my students of the students are supervised being uh, the, the, the best and the most uh, brilliant. I cross fingers for one to, to be awarded, uh, uh, to be this uh, year's laureate of the award, uh, um, uh, uh, et cetera. So that this is a very, very short uh, presentation of myself. Thanks uh, so much indeed, Anna. I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation with you. So to our second speaker this afternoon, Dr. Aurelien Mondon 
is a senior lecturer at the University of Bath in our near neighbour, the United Kingdom. Uh, Aurelian's interests include the mainstreaming of far-right discourse of racism and Islamophobia in elite discourses, right-wing populism more generally, and the notion of the people as a threat to democracy, amongst others. He is the author of <clears throat> quite a range of academic artic articles, including um, his latest book, which is co-authored with another of our speakers this afternoon, Dr. Aaron Winter, Reactionary Democracy, How Racism and the Populist Far Right Became Mainstream. Many of you, I think, will know the publication published by Verso in 2020. A pleasure to welcome you this afternoon, Aurelien. Over to you. Thank you, John, uh, and thank you for the for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, I will have to uh, to go fairly early because I have to go and give a lecture on uh, on race and racism actually uh, to our first year students. So uh, you know, duty calls. Uh, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Aaron will be talking more about uh, about our research uh, in a minute when he when he introduces himself and and ourselves. But yeah, just to say that. I mean, this is, you know, this is great to be here because this is something that is dear to, to both of our hearts and research in many ways. And um, both of us have been researching the far right and the mainstreaming of the far right for a very long time and, and for a very long time together as well. Um, and this is what we're really interested in, in a way, beyond just the far right. It's actually how the mainstream reacts to the far right. And sometimes the mainstream brings the far right into its own kind of discourses. And so what we're really interested in is the tensions between between the mainstream, the far right, and how, how concepts such as populism can actually help legitimize far right ideas and help them enter the mainstream. Thanks very much indeed, Aurelia. <clears throat> Our third speaker this afternoon uh, is also very welcome. Simone Raphael is a journalist and editor in chief of Bell Tower News, a network for digital civil society in Germany. She also heads the digital project area for the Amade Antonio Foundation, founded in 1998. The foundation is one of Germany's foremost independent non-governmental organizations working to strengthen democratic civil society and eliminate neo-Nazism, right-wing extremism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of bigotry and hate in Germany. Pleasure to welcome you this afternoon, Simone. Thank you very much, John. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about our experiences. Uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, I work for a foundation in Germany, the Amadeo Antonio Foundation. And um, from this perspective, we have always a focus uh, to strengthen a democratic civil society, to, so to work with people who are willing uh, or wanting to stand up against uh, racism, anti-Semitism, or the far right. And we do this with uh, um, a lot of years of experience now and a lot of different uh, things we could learn ourselves while doing so um, as the situation in Germany also changed over the um, 30 years the foundation is existing now. But mainly we try to look at topics we uh, think are dangerous for democracy in our country or even in uh, Europe or in broader um, circumstances. And we try to develop uh, things we can do as civil society against it, which means we do advocacy trainings and fundings for civil society organizations or smaller clubs all over Germany. Um, but we also do lobby work uh, in politics, work with um, companies or social media companies, especially um, because the digital space is a, a place where I am working a lot, not only on the uh, publishing side, but um, as you said, um, if you work on far-right extremism or racism or anti-Semitism online, you have no other chance than to uh, uh, develop strategies uh, uh, against the hate you are uh, getting if you are uh, just talking about those topics. So we developed a range of projects uh, also in the digital space to strengthen the digital uh, democratic society, as I put it. Um, and especially since the rise of the uh, AFD as a, at the beginning um, right-wing popular, and now I would say radicalized to a far right party uh, in parliament uh, still there. Um, there was also a lot of um, reasons to develop strategies, how to deal with that, because of course it's a difference uh, if you have this, these ideas, not only 
um, on social media platforms or demonstrations on the streets, but also in parliament. And I think we will talk about this later on and I'm very happy to be in this conversation. Thanks so much indeed, Simone. Our final speaker this afternoon, Aaron Winter is Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of East London. Aaron's research is similarly on the far right with a focus on racism, mainstreaming and violence. He is co-editor with Aurelian of Researching the Far Right Theory, Method and Practice. Uh, that's, sorry, that's his Routledge book with uh, Aurelian, his book, his Verso book, Reactionary Democracy, How Racism and the Populist Far Right Became Mainstream. He's also a co-editor of Identities, Global Studies in Culture and Power, and the Manchester University Press series, Racism, Resistance and Social Change. Aaron, a pleasure to welcome you too. Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. Um, yeah, so Aurelian said a little bit about um, our work together. And I think I'd like to start by saying that what we work on is the mainstreaming of racism and the far right. And one of the, this is predicated on the fact that both of us come to far right studies from different disciplines. I'm in sociology and criminology and Aurelian is in politics um, as anti-racists. And we are seeking to challenge um, the often what is the euphemization or exceptionalization of racism as something that is far right out of the bounds of acceptability, um, but also a clear distinction between the far right and the mainstream. So what we effectively are looking at is the rise of mainstreaming of racist and reactionary movements, parties, players and ideas often referred to as populist, radical right populist, far right and or fascist, notably through the use of democracy um, as well as liberalism and populism as labels or euphemisms used in the service of reactionary and specifically racist politics, where racism and the far right ideas are often represented as both the product of and serving a democratic will of the people in this so-called populist moment and an illiberal threat to liberal democracy. The latter often justifying more moderate or acceptable ideas and policies to fend off the threat of the far right, which still legitimizes their ideas and links them to the people, who are often defined as or racialized as the white working class, even while evoking the specter of an exceptionalist kind of extremism or terrorism. And it also moves the center far, sorry, right, wait, right words. I mean, part of what we're, we're making an argument is, is, that, is that in some ways, racism and the far right are seen as exceptional, extremist, et cetera, but also legitimized through so-called populist narratives and or euphemized by the term populism in ways in which they are attributed to a demographic, a white working class, a left behind, or the people um, and somehow sort of let in the door um, by saying that if we don't, as politicians, establishment parties, give some ground to these and have more acceptable or moderate forms of immigration control, for example, or banning the burqa um, in some cases, um, then the far right will take over. In reactionary democracy, we look at France, the US and UK, as well as touching on other countries and more theoretically, developing several concepts to understand this. Reactionary democracy being one, illiberal versus liberal racism, where um, liberal forms of racism often offset or displace racism onto some illiberal fascist past or fringe and justify more colorblind um, racist policies and sidestepping addressing systemic and structural racism, as well as the processes of mainstreaming we look at and populist or the populist hype, which Aurelian has written extensively about. And we use these concepts and this analysis to not only better understand the current conjuncture, but challenge the mainstreaming of racism in the far right. And in a sense, we actually feel that concepts like democracy and populism actually serve to mainstream, not just try to understand racism in the far right. Thank you. Thanks. Very much indeed, hugely interesting themes, and we'll be coming back to these uh, throughout our discussion. 
If I can turn back now to the first of our discussants, uh, Anna Kerstebe. Anna, I just wanted to begin with you uh, because I know you believe that we have to um, uh, sort of define that which we are engaged with. And I wonder if you might sort of speak about the specificities of the Bulgarian case and some of the issues that feed into how you define the problem in your work. Thank, th thank you very much for this uh, context uh, sensitivity because uh, the countries are very different and the post-communist uh, uh, ones uh, uh, have their specifics and Bulgaria is not a very well-known uh, case. So mission uh, impossible to summarize in a few minutes uh, the specificity of the Bulgarian case. Uh, um, I'll do uh, by distinguishing uh, four periods uh, in the three decades uh, uh, post-democratic uh, developments, four uh, periods uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the emergence, presence, uh, development of the far right. So the first, uh, and uh, um, I'll emphasize the paradoxes because I could not describe them so that uh, I'll name, identify uh, the major paradox of the far right at the specific uh, period and uh, the main challenge uh, uh, for the uh, civic activism. Uh, and then later at the debate, uh, I could elaborate more on the civic activism. So the first stage and the first paradox uh, is uh, a fragile, very fragile post-communist uh, democracy at the real beginning of the 90s versus no far right. We did not have far right 15 years after the transition. Second period, consolidated, not stable, etc., but consolidated according, let's say, to the indicators of political science democracy versus emergence of a far right. Again, very paradoxical emergence because no migration crisis, no economic crisis, none of the usual suspects was present, but suddenly the far right emerged. Third period and uh, a new paradox. So far right in government, uh, coalition government, of course, and as if it is not enough, mainstreaming of the far right discourses, practices, etc. And the current period, so really this year, again, a very paradoxical situation where we have mainstreaming of the far right without far right. Without a far right is not a wishful thinking. It's of course an exaggeration because the far right is there. It, uh, yeah, it did, not, did not disappear, but it did disappear from the main, let's say, political bodies. They are not in government anymore and they are not in parliament. So there are two parliaments, very short wise parliaments this year, so that we are on the eve of third parliamentary elections. But we had two parliaments without far right, but the, this lack of political representation of the, par, of the far right did not decrease, let's say, or diminished or even soften uh, the mainstreaming of uh, uh, far right t topics, these frames and discourses. And very shortly, just uh, uh, let's say the challenges uh, uh, for civic agency, civic activism, and uh, citizenship at each of those levels uh, of uh, uh, each of these uh, stages. So the first one, no far right, so no need in a way of mobilization, but let's say important, uh, um, how to say challenge for the civic activity to emancipate uh, uh, from uh, the, what I call NGO -nization of the civil society. So civil society is, uh, let's say quite positive, term almost everywhere, but let's say for the communist countries, it was, uh, uh, how to say, an external project imported in our countries with uh, generous funding, etc., etc., and uh, uh, which did not allow for long years, let's say, the emergence of authentic, uh, let's say, not paid uh, civic agency. And such, let's say, slowly emerged 
let's say, during this uh, uh, first period. The second period, uh, this uh, sudden emergence uh, of the uh, party far, far right, uh, um, so that shock of uh, their aggressive appearance in the public space, uh, so that it was uh, uh, really a great uh, uh, challenge for, for, for the media, for the other political actors, but at the same time, a really privileged moment where several actors, uh, so more liberal, more moderate political actors, journalists, intellectuals, civic activists, they unite, let's say, against the far right. Third stage mainstreaming of the far right, almost no political actors, let's say no cordon sanitaire at all, but almost no political actors deliberately, let's say, confronting, uh, let's say, these mainstream discourses, really public space under the hegemony of the far right frames and discourses and uh, 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 topics. So marginalization of the civic voices countering the far right, but at the same time, so to opposite uh, uh, trends, this very negative marginalization from one side uh, uh, and decrease of the civic voices in number and uh, 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 let's say in impact, but at the same time, resilience of uh, those pro-diversity uh, voices and actors. And the last uh, um, period we are currently in uh, this mainstreaming of far right <laughs> without far right paradoxically does not bring an, let's say a new strength, let's say to uh, the pro-diversity uh, actors uh, who fortunately are still there, but there is no special renaissance of uh, uh, this activity. And during the debate, or if I have a second, let's say round uh, of uh, uh, speech, I would elaborate a few actors and uh, strategies and practices. Uh, um, yeah, John, it's up to you to tell me, should, should I do it now or at a second round of speeches? We'll come back, I think, absolutely. We have lots of time and there are so many interesting things to uh, pick up on there. Uh, Simone, if I can turn to you next um, on the question of the extent to which online platforms facilitate, encourage and amplify hate, it's in some ways an important week. Some people believe that the um, light that has been shone on Facebook in the United States and earlier this week in Britain uh, by whistleblowers and their activities gives us a chink of light that the almost unremitting waves of hatred that were facilitated by these big platforms are finally, um, if not being reversed, at least potentially being reversed. There's a seriousness of purpose now about some actors in taking on these big tech firms. And I just wonder from your perspective, um, um, it, 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 what are you seeing in Germany about the extent of this? And in response to th that online world, what kind of strategies are being employed within civil society to try and counter these? Yes, this is a, uh, is a big question and a perfect uh, topic for me uh, as I work on this topic for 10 years now. Um, I can assure you we already had uh, far-right extremism and uh, hate speech on these platforms uh, for a long time because uh, this scene uh, really saw from the very beginning of all kinds of communication online, they saw their chances to spread their propaganda, their hatred, uh, their racism and everything they're doing online. Uh, but I would say from my perspective that the invention of uh, social media was really a game changer for the far right extremist scene um, or all anti-democratic scenes, I have to say, because they got a totally new um, thing to spread their propaganda to celebrate their hateful lifestyle online, uh, of course, to recruit no fo new followers, uh, influence uh, or try at least to influence the public opinion uh, and media opinion. And of course, what far right extremists always like to do is to threaten uh, and to try to mute people uh, online they see as political enemies or because of their racist or anti Semitic worldview. 
Uh, so we see this problem for quite a long time, and uh, I can see this is, say that this is not, not only the perspective of the NGO world, the social networks itself uh, realized this from the start as well. So uh, I would say, yes, uh, I see um, steps going forward um, with all uh, engagement of uh, civil uh, the digital civil society. I see some engagement by the social media companies as well. I see some um, tries by politics uh, to start to regulate what is going on online. But I think there's still a lot of um, steps to go. Um, as I would say, um, we have these different actors who can play a role in this discussion, um, but uh, uh, it took a really a long time uh, to have the seriousness of, of the topic. So uh, in uh, the internet society, a long time trolling seemed to be a kind of uh, pleasure for people, something just for the lulz. So nobody wanted to take it too seriously. And when I talked to social media companies 10 years ago, um, about topics like hate speech and digital violence. Uh, very friendly people were telling me that they didn't want to talk to me about these ugly topics because they are sunny side up platforms and they're only bringing pleasure to people. Um, we know now that this is not right and that uh, um, on these platforms radicalization is taking place, uh, that the hate and the violence we see online does not stay online. Uh, we have uh, violence uh, in the offline world, which was organized or um, started in the online world. So there's a lot of work to do. And the first thing um, which was done, I would say um, in Germany, but I think all over the world was to put it on the users and saying, um, hey, if you don't want uh, this uh, kind of um, discussions online, if you don't want to see the hate, um, just go out of the conversation. So if you want to stay, then counter argue to that. Um, so this uh, led all the uh, all the work to the people who should be protected, I would say, um, because they just wanted to come into a digital um, world to discuss topics they're interested in, to connect, perhaps to empower each other on uh, important political topics, for example, and uh, got all the hate for that. Um, as I said, um, after some of the years, you can say that there are more, stra more strategies, but still more to go. Um, the social media companies, I would say, uh, are urged um, and sometimes also perhaps uh, want to uh, change the situation, at least uh, looking at moderation, looking at hateful groups online um, or very explicit far right behavior, which is taken, uh, taken down. Um, but we have a lot of amount of uh, toxic narrations which are not illegal, which are uh, not um, even not even uh, illegal after the community standards of the social media companies and stay online still. Um, some of them support NGOs um, doing work for democratic values on platform. I think this is a good way, of course, but it's not enough. Um, what we still don't have is any transparency about uh, how, for example, the algorithms are working. We can just suggest or, or guess um, how much impact on radicalization it has uh, if I go to a platform like YouTube or nowadays or TikTok, uh, where I have a strong algorithm always recommending me uh, um, even more brutal or more violent um, content. This is really a problem, but we can't have proper research and proper civil society watches over that because we don't have access still. Um, and so uh, I'm also not very happy about uh, political regulations. As you might know, Germany is one of the countries who also has a law on hate speech, um, the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, a very German word, uh, the Network Enforcement Act, if you translate it. Um, and a lot of uh, other European countries are looking on, at this law and uh, guessing this might be something very useful. Um, you, um, <laughs> do you have an idea when I say it like that, that I'm not so happy with the uh, NSDG because uh, it only tackles very obvious uh, illegal contents um, on the great on, on the big platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. These contents are already taken down for years. Um, but the more complicated cases, so where it's not so easy to detect if something is illegal or isn't, um, the decision is uh, put on the companies um, and not on a, uh, on the justice system, which should be a better part to to have these decisions. If you look on this complicated um, discussion about freedom of speech and protecting people online. So this is not a very uh, happy situation at the moment. And for me, 
um, it's not uh, um, sufficient at all because uh, we don't get any regulation on the algorithms, as I said, or transparency on that. And we don't have any uh, improvement for the victims of uh, hate-based violence online. So these people who are attacked uh, on platform, for example, they still have no better chances to get in contact, to get uh, uh, posts deleted, for example, which are doxing them, putting their addresses online or the schools of their children, which all is happening if you engage against far right extremism online. Uh, so this is still a big uh, thing to do. Um, on the civil society part, we of course also started with doing uh, counter argumentation trainings and things like that. We don't do this so much anymore because if you put it on the single person sitting in front of the computer, people get burned out very fast because it's very uh, exhausting to argue with people who are not willing to listen to you uh, and threat you from just existing. Uh, so um, at the moment, we are more focusing on um, empowering uh, social media uh, activities of big organizations, uh, big media outlets, parties. So big actors in the uh, public discourse who have uh, a, a role, a voice which will be heard, but also a resp responsibility what is going on on their online uh, platforms. And in Germany, still a lot of these sites are not very well moderated or not moderated at all. So I still see a lot of work to do and improvements to be coming if we uh, get more organizations to really promote democratic values online and uh, also to moderate their sites. Um, may I just ask, um, yeah. Germany held a general election, parliamentary election, federal yeah. election in September. Um, the AFD um, seems to be flatlining at the national level in Germany its support, however, is much more strongly concentrated in the eastern part of Germany, the OGDR, and the West. So perhaps you'd say something about that. That doesn't mean necessarily that your average AFD voter is voting um, or because of being propelled by racism. There may be other reasons. The AFD came into existence, for example, as an anti-Euro party originally, and then morphed into this far-right entity. So uh, maybe you'd say something about those regional differences, at least in voting terms and what they say about Germany. Yes, definitely. Um, yes, uh, the AFD did not uh, um, succeed in having more votes than in the last um, um, federal election. This is a good thing, but they're stable on a, on a niveau which is too high for me, I would say. They get a lot of money now and money for the AFD means uh, they build up structures of the far right um, in the places where they have a big support. Uh, and uh, as you just said, um, it was uh, with this election very obvious to see that they have the strongest support in the eastern part of Germany. And I think some of these developments resonate to the things we heard from Bulgaria beforehand, as uh, the eastern part is also the post-communist uh, society. Um, we see uh, that uh, there's still after 30 years after, after um, the war fell down, there's still a lot of work to do uh, dealing with democracy, with instability, instabilities. Uh, a lot of people um, have the feeling that they could uh, stabilize themselves or make themselves feel better if they act as racists, as uh, asking for authoritarian uh, governments, um, opposing everything which is, uh, could be said as a part of a modern world. If you look at uh, equality, for example, for everyone in the country, which is something which uh, uh, the AFD always puts as a threat for people um, who have uh, lived for, for years in the country. And this resonates mainly in the, in the eastern parts. Um, we have also some uh, cities and uh, regions in the western part. We have also strong uh, AFD votes, but very uh, fewer than in the eastern part. So this is a problem, and this is, of course, also a problem because in Germany, the society doesn't want to talk very openly about this topic. Um, because you have to look uh, in, in the history of what um, the differences are, why we see these developments, and uh, this is... Um, kind of painful, you have to say, as uh, for example, in the in the eastern part of Germany, coming uh, from the GDR structures, um, they were named to be anti-fascists by the state, but there was never any work on uh, national socialism and what it meant to be part of this, for example, in the GDR. 
And these, for example, build up structures we still see today that people learn from their grandfathers and grandmothers that uh, national socialism was not such a bad thing and uh, um, that they were in the Wehrmacht and were very heavy soldiers and things like that. And we see that these narrations within the families have a strong role, of course, in narrations in the cities or in the rural areas. So the um, AFD gets the most votes in the rural areas. And so this is also a thing as the democratic parties have to have to discuss and think about why the people in rural areas have the feeling that they are so neglected that they turn to uh, um, far right parties instead of uh, wishing for democratic parties to help them. Because the AFD, this is, this is totally clear also in the eastern part of Germany, has no solutions for any of those problems. They only have hatred uh, for the system, for democracy itself and racism. Um, but um, nonetheless, the people know that they vote them for this. So this is really a problem we are dealing with at the moment. Thanks very much indeed, Simone. I want to turn now, if I could, to Aaron, if that's okay. And Aaron, thank you so much for waiting patiently. Um, you recently published a co-edited volume on researching the far right with your colleagues. Could you tell us perhaps about some of the difficulties one encounters in writing about the far right and its activities in Europe and any recommendations springing from your experience and your work about how to deal with these? I'm absolutely happy to. I'm just, I'm conscious that Aurelian has to go at 3.45 and I thought maybe he would be able to answer your question first, if that's possible. Sure, sure, certainly. That's absolutely fine. And given that Aurelian is one of the co-authors of the book, that's uh, absolutely appropriate to him as well. I mean, I, I, I'm actually not a co-author of his book, so go ahead, Aaron. It's fine. I'll um, yeah, I'll just I'll just listen. It's all good. Okay. Okay. So to you, Aaron, again. <clears throat> um, yeah. So uh, researching the far right, I, th I think I think centrally to what um, me and Aurelian do. Um, both together and, and our independent work. Um, it's about, I guess, conceptualizing the far right. And one of the things we're very conscious of is within any given volume on the far right, there is a lot of policing and reviewing of definitions. Um, but sometimes that seeks accuracy, sometimes it seeks consensus, sometimes it seeks to, to um, get up to speed with the latest research or gatekeepers. But what is rarely fully, fully opened up and engaged with is what is at stake um, when we understand the far right as a discrete, I guess, object of study or phenomenon. And oftentimes that requires one to, to segment it or compartmentalize it off from the mainstream. And in a lot of cases with research on the far right, and I think analysis more broadly, even outside of academia, media, policy reports, et cetera, um, is to see the threat of the far right as that to democracy. And what ends up happening is, is that racism is somehow placed in the hands of the far right or in the past, in fascism, for example, fascism of the past, um, sometimes in some countries, slavery and colonialism. In this particular country um, that I'm in now, um, colonialism is not as seen as a bigger problem. In fact, it's often uh, 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 something to be nostalgic about or to defend or to celebrate. It's one of these great ironies that, you know, you know, racism's all in the past, but don't criticize the statues we have about that past. Um, but the reason I'm raising this is because what me and Aurelian kind of wonder is what is at stake? Why do people hate the far right? Do they think it's a threat to democracy? And if so, when they place all the racism in it, they show, I think often demonstrate that they don't really care about racism. Because in fact, the racism within our liberal democracies, the, the history, the structures, the, the systems and processes that we employ show that, so almost show the function of the far right to exceptionalize, compartmentalize racism itself which is ironic because often a lot of far right studies, they, um, they euphemize racism because they still can't tackle it. It's, it's identity, diversity, ethnic minorities, 
or terms that, or, or discrimination or xenophobia, but rarely tackling racism itself. And if that is done, it doesn't, it often doesn't also tax systemic racism. And I'd have to say that as much as I think the far right is a threat, um, the, the main threat is not to democracy. The main threat is to the people at the sharp end of that racism. And actually that racism, those people at the sharp end of that racism are also the, the targets and the victims of state racism. And that's racism, including um, that in the police and criminal justice system, which makes and counterterrorism and counter extremism um, systems and agencies. And in that sense, the idea that we would take this problem called the far right, sanctify li liberal democracy as if it's not already entangled in colonialism, racism, um, and other forms of inequality, injustice, and discrimination, and then hand over the task of dealing with the far right to the same agencies that deny and fail to address institutional racism or institutional Islamophobia when it comes to, say, counterterrorism and counter extremism is, is both shocking to me, both politically, um, sociologically, analytically, um, and historically. And I think part of our project is an intervention into that, is to challenge that compartmentalization and challenge that idea that all we need is more state and private enterprise policing of something we've called extreme because we cannot face these problems that are in our structure that often the far right actually operate as the street soldiers for and distraction from. And that's not to say they're not a threat. That is not to say that we don't need to tackle them. But I think that what part of our, our argument is, is that if you're gonna tackle them, you need to tackle them in a manner that addresses these issues. At the same time, underpinning this, the analysis, the analysis that is conducted by think tanks, NGOs, academics, needs to not validate and legitimize this complete compartmentalization and feed systems that are systems that are institutionally racist themselves in the fight. And I would just say this, just to end it, one of the reasons is, is because the amount of people chasing funding and chasing publications to deal with this alleged new threat of the far right, having spent time dealing with that problem of Islamism and feeding that same state policies, practices, et cetera, um, are merely operating now on a system of equivalence that does not understand the power differential with the far right and those associated with Islam Muslims or are called Islamist in a sense, in a sense that they are never, those they claim to represent or those, or those organizations or activists or terrorists ne are never seen by the mainstream establishment parties as saying like, oh, we have to get those constituencies, otherwise they're gonna turn to terrorism like they do with the far right, which also legitimizes far right ideas. And I'm, I'm sorry for going on, but it's one of the things is that we think, we think central to this is an analysis which challenges this underlying structure and problem within far right studies. Going back to um, the conversation with Simone and uh, Anna, um, Anna mentioned that there had been two general elections in Bulgaria this year. The far right actually failed to meet the threshold in both of those contests, and likely the same will happen on the 14th of November in their third election. Um, similarly, the AFD was the dog that didn't bark so much in the German federal election. So is there a danger that actually we talk too much about the far right? Um, uh, and, I'm conscious here too of the large volume of research that has emerged out of the last decade, um, uh, that in a sense, we give it a kind of validity that it doesn't deserve. I'm, I'm conscious also that I'm speaking from Ireland where we have an electoral system that more than any other system in Europe encourages small and fringe parties, no electoral threshold, and yet we don't have a far right presence in parliament and yet the volume of attention that it gets nationally in the media and so on seems really disproportionate. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I mean, I'm, I'm hoping I'm doing also some of Aurelian's other work justice um, because he's worked a lot on this. Um, I think one of the things is, is that and you have three things going on. You have that sort of amplification of these figures. And I've often thought the amplification of these figures gives them airtime, gives them a platform. Sometimes 
it is more positive in the sense that you say Trump, et cetera, whoever, um, represents the left behind. You give it some sort of sociological legitimacy, right? There's no basis for that argument, but it's become this absolute truism again and again and again. And in our book, we deb- and in our, our identities article on whiteness, populace, populism, and the racialization of the working class in the UK and US, we do debunk a lot of that, a lot of that, that those narratives statistically. Um, but the the point is, is that you give it, you give it a validity. Sometimes when it, when it gets on there, it, it attaches itself or it gets attached to a narrative. At the, at the best of times, it gets its own platform. I mean, Bannon going on and on and on, on every single channel when he's got his own platforms. Um, then you, have, I mean, Farage didn't, can't win an election, but he gets, he gets on question time all the time. Yeah. You know, Tommy Robinson gets on, gets on the media again and again and again, claiming to be canceled and silenced and censored. It's, it, and how, I don't understand how people are not recognizing this and the media is not, I mean, of course they're not recognizing because it, it's clickbait, right? <laughs> at, at least. Um, but what ends up happening is, is that even if you get them on to play the fool, or the stew, the far right stooge, that you they do so in ways that still legitimize these ideas, like we need to control immigration, Muslims this, this people that, Black Lives Matter that, Antifa this, and it ends up legitimizing increasing analyses which condemn, criticize, demonize, <laughs> and give voice to those far right ideas. At the same time, it puts the idea in again and again and again to mainstream establishment politicians that these are the votes they got to get because otherwise it's going to be this guy yeah. in power. And I think that's extremely, extremely dangerous. And this is what we we're talking about when we we're talking about populism. And, and Aurelian has worked um, himself and with others on this concept of the populist hype. I think it's very helpful here. The idea that you label something populist, you give it this democratic Kind of, kind of credentials. This idea of this is a vote getter. This speaks to the people, and increasingly, you have politicians going like, "Well, we need to have more populist platform," and populism is often a euphemism for immigration controls, Islamophobia, racism, far right ideas in more moderate form. And one of the other things it does is it keeps on giving voice to these these kind of ideas and these movements and these parties, what they effectively do is say, this is the alternative to the establishment. And we already know in terms of race, gender, class, um, and a whole bunch of other sort of inequalities and justices that they are affirming, they are at best distracting from addressing the problem. At worst, they are the power structure. And so you'll have nothing but, it'll be nothing but reaffirmed again and again and again. And the media really, really needs to be challenged on this. Um, I would also say that far people who are working in far right studies need to need to not always highlight this because they want to sell a book or an article, but actually actually say what is the what am I doing here? What am I telling politicians? What am I telling students? What am I telling other researchers about how seriously to take these organizations as a discrete phenomenon? Yeah, well, that gives me the perfect opportunity to go back to Anna, if I could, please. Anna, you mentioned that um, Bulgaria is heading into a general election on the 14th of November, presidential election as well. You may well set the world record for the number of elections to be held (laughs) a single year. (laughs) But it's taking place against this terrible, catastrophic backdrop of increased COVID infections, record numbers of infections over the last days, record numbers of deaths, higher even than the peak last winter. Um, It's a terrible tragedy. And I wonder if you might say something about the role that misinformation has played in Bulgaria, because of course the vaccination rate in Bulgaria at about 22, 23% is the lowest in the European Union. Uh, thanks for asking the question. Um, I would never raise myself, uh, let's say, to, to blame just, uh, uh, let's say, one, uh, one part of the political scene, so the far right for that. Uh, uh, but uh, that's why, uh, let's say, the concept of mainstreaming uh, of the far right populism uh, is really adequate, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, what happened uh, uh, in Bulgaria uh, is really poison 
the public sphere by conspiracy, by fake news, uh, by uh, mistrust in every institution. So the first in science, in experts, in state institutions, in medicine, in everything. Uh, and uh, so these are, uh, 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 let's say, the far right uh, uh, team. So when the far right entered the political scene uh, 15, 16 years ago, so the, initially they, it's the real, let's say, start, they started speaking of perverted Europe. At that time, let's say, this sexual presentation of, of Europe, we were still not European members, we aspired to become European members. It, let's say, sound yeah, exotic. We did not, let's say, understand we, the public opinion, etc. But slowly, and in historic term, in fact, very rapidly, in less than a decade, this sexualized, let's say, understanding of everything, let's say, is already the hegemonic discourse. We are in a terrible, let's say, <clears throat> health crisis. We are uh, uh, in a very, very heavy, let's say, economic crisis. There is an energy crisis, et cetera, et cetera. And can you imagine what, what is the main issue, not of the far right, but of the only left-wing actor Okay, they should not be called this way, but anyway, the Bulgarian Socialist Party is the only actor in the left wing space in Bulgaria. It is the Istanbul Convention and the Istanbul Convention, which is against, uh, let's say, domestic violence, but which was translated to the Bulgarian public as invention of new genre, uh, let's say, by those liberal intellectuals and by the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, in a situation when in the country, the constitutional court, let's say, decided that the Istanbul Convention is against the constitution so that it is even not, let's say, part of the uh, political agenda after, let's say, the decision of the constitutional court. So in this mixture of surreal, let's say, topics uh, so that invented genders, Istanbul Convention, etc. So the, 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 the fabric of, uh, of the social life has changed. That's why I'm saying mainstreaming of the far right. Uh, and uh, let's say just uh, another example to connect more directly, uh, let's say with the election. So the, we have the rector of Sofia University as one of the major candidates, uh, let's say, for the presidency, uh, of course, uh, so prominent intellectual, etc. When asked about vaccination, he almost escaped the question, but let's say, saying in a half of a sentence, I could not, uh, let's say, appeal because I was half of the electorate. So the representative of science in this election he refuses to speak on behalf of science. He refuses to speak on behalf of the health so that with the, uh, this death uh, uh, rate every, every, uh, every day, I feel more safe when I travel abroad so that I'm vaccinated. But okay, just to, the, uh, 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 okay, just to say. So uh, really this mainstreaming of the far right topics changed the public opinion, changed uh, or impacted the, the political responsibilities of mainstream parties, which do not dare openly speaking against, let's say those frames in the public discourse. And this is where we are, so that when you say, I, I do understand and I do appreciate, let's say, how to say, um, um, your concern, uh, do we reify far right when we speak on the far right, uh, uh, when in electoral terms, it is not such a big, uh, let's say, phenomenon. So I do understand and I do share, let's say, these intellectual concerns, 
but looking at and analyzing what is going on in my country. So uh, um, I, I do think that we have to try to understand, especially this phenomenon of the, of the mainstreaming of the far right. Just to give you an example, a politician uh, from, um, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm here, as I mentioned, that uh, yeah, another university, so people yeah, want to say something to me, interrupting me a little bit. Uh, so a politician from moderate party, who is a doctor himself, who used to be <clears throat> Minister of Health, and who said for the Roma, you are beasts in a public speech, and you will be treated as beast. Can you imagine? Are we European countries in 21st century, etc.? So for the public space to allow, and he was not fired next day, he's okay, yeah, I will not to speak of him, him anymore, but just to say that there are no, how to say that there, 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 are, there is no protection, let's say, in a way, there are very few civic activists who we are trying to do something, but uh, uh, it is, uh, okay, so, we are the only, let's say, traces that we do not live in a totalitarian society. No. We live, we are living in a point, <clears throat> I, I, let's say, society. Your point about mainstreaming is is so important, and you gave a very, very good example. In my own case, I was actually having a medical procedure in Bulgaria in mm -hmm. August, and the guy, the doctor who was giving me the anesthetic. He, he said something like, yes, we have a very good country, except for the Roma. And again, I couldn't believe this was a trained medical profession, uh, profession who, was, who, who was actually uh, uh, saying this. Um, thanks uh, very much indeed, Anna. I just one final question to, to you, Anna, again, sorry, before we open things up to the Q&A. Um, I know that you've worked a lot on European projects on citizenship, and I've had the pleasure of working with you on some of them. Um, uh, just the question about the um, uh, how social movements and NGOs might improve their strategies against the far right. What is your sense of that? Um, in some countries, like, uh, let's say, uh, in mind, they are the only, let's say, uh, counter forces, or, or we call them uh, with a very nice term, antibodies, uh, uh, so that which try to preserve, uh, let's say, the health uh, of, uh, 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 yeah, of uh, society, so that uh, social peace and uh, some openness uh, and some humanity, uh, even basic humanity, not to allow doctors, let's say, to speak without any context so that they are operating you and he speaks against Roma so that uh, there is no context, but still there is uh, uh, hate speech. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, the social movements uh, are, are, are crucial um, so that I do share, let's say, this idea that social movements are protest movements, so that uh, they problematize and they bring alternatives, let's say, to major trends uh, in society. But I uh, do conceptualize, uh, uh, let's say, uh, this uh, uh, civic resistance or uh, civic alternatives uh, uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, two other concepts, uh, which I think are more relevant and more insightful. Uh, so one is uh, uh, citizenship, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, very shortly, uh, I'll explain. Uh, so citizenship everywhere, let's say, has, uh, let's say, two meanings, status and activism. But during communism, there is just, uh, there was just one me uh, uh, meaning, so that uh, status, uh, which is a definition, let's say, from the state and, uh, uh, let's say, top, top, uh, top down. So legitimizing citizenship as uh, something which depends uh, also on citizens, which is created through the activism, through the activity, through the commitment of citizens is a bright new idea for the uh, post-communist uh, public, uh, public and uh, democratic space. Uh, so this is, uh, so that terminological, but also a very fundamental, let's say, change to say that citizenship is not in the, only in the hands of the state, but also of the citizens. And the other one is agency. I do believe very much 
let's say, uh, in this individual agency, so that uh, because individuals are those who create alternatives, etc. But uh, let's say in terms of, uh, uh, I don't know if I have the time to, to give a few nice examples, uh, let's say from Europe, but also let's say from uh, my country, uh, from uh, 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 my country, I'll take uh, yeah, probably two or three from Bulgaria and two or, or three abroad. My favorite, favorite uh, uh, example is the trampoline uh, house in uh, Copenhagen, uh, uh, where two artists, uh, uh, so not uh, yeah, even not civic activists before, so they took a house, abundant one, et cetera, and transformed it into a house for everybody with the idea, let's say integration day one, so that it is open for refugees, for migrants, for un for um, uh, undocumented, uh, 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 etc., and they do everything together, from culture to, uh, let's say, psychological workshops uh, to to uh, to cooking, uh, 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 etc. And uh, it became uh, really an inspiring model, so that uh, implemented already in a lot of uh, cities and countries. The other one uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, it was a pre-COVID, but uh, very. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, uh, important for uh, COVID uh, conditions, uh, global cleaning in Finland, uh, uh, where doctors and uh, uh, dentists, they uh, work for free for uh, um, uh, undocumented uh, uh, migrants, uh, how to say, blurring the, the distinction between legal and legitimate. It is not legal to do that, but uh, okay, in a situation of crisis, okay, humanitarian, let's say, considerations uh, uh, could be of, uh, of uh, 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 higher value. And I could give one or two examples, let's say also from Bulgaria to show uh, how to say that uh, uh, even in this situation uh, um, of uh, um, systemic, I like uh, in the iron, the systemic racism and the systemic, uh, let's say uh, far right uh, um, yeah, issues, every um, which became hegemonic, not systemic, but hegemonic. Uh, everywhere, there are uh, initiatives which are successful and uh, which create uh, alternatives. I'll take uh, probably just two. I like very much, of course, I'm active in <laughs> uh, all of them and in others uh, uh, too. So one uh, uh, is uh, anti Wook of March. So Wook of March uh, uh, is an annual um, uh, march, uh, uh, um, uh, new Nazi. Uh, March, uh, very popular uh, among young people because they go with the torches so that it is very spectacular, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and for years, the authorities played the game, they bend it, but it remains invisible and it still takes place. And so that there have been long years of mobilization of civic actors in a variety of forms. Uh, so that against uh, uh, this uh, new Nazi uh, 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 march. Okay, I could detail, but we have no time. And another one, um, uh, 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 okay, so that uh, which uh, expresses, uh, uh, let's say, um, I'm fan of contemporary art, so that it expresses also my, uh, uh, let's say, belief that uh, art uh, is a very powerful instrument of politics of transformation. Um, uh, and so that art is mobilized in a variety of forms. So just two examples So my university uh, where there uh, are very strong art departments uh, uh, is currently preparing a, a, a theater with the unaccompanied minors. I'm interviewing, let's say the unaccompanied minors and several of them are engaged in this performance uh, uh, so that in a very creative way, uh, uh, it is really, uh, touching uh, to, uh, to go uh, to go deeper and the last example uh, it is the fight uh, let's say for reconquering uh, the public space uh, um, uh, uh, one example there was a very nice initiative of uh, artists uh, against hate, hate speech with a lot of uh, uh, yeah street art and other performances and there was really a fight of interpretation so one of the street art um, uh, yeah, painting uh, uh, was uh, yeah, for refugees, very nice one with the big wave, this uh, famous Japanese uh, uh, painting, etc., with a photo of refugees. And so uh, the, we do not know who, but uh, new Nazi, uh, uh, let's say they transformed it into a, uh, uh, we ha uh, hate you, Europe, or something like that. Uh, uh, 
And then uh, the, uh, the third round of this fight for interpretation and fight for the public space, uh, it was again, uh, let's say, regained with a lot of hearts. Uh, uh, and so that uh, uh, love you, Europe, uh, 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 etc. So uh, um, this uh, very nice uh, uh, example shows, uh, let's say, how strong, uh, let's say, all actors are uh, uh, in a way. So the neo Nazi who want to really to conquer the public space with their hate and the resistance uh, of uh, artists, of civic actors. Uh, what we did was, uh, let's say, to share photos of the three stages, uh, etc., and to say, we are here, so the city dwellers of uh, Sofia, and we want our space to be open and multicultural, uh, etc., et, et etc. Et so that um, we are less and less numerous in a way. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, the liberal yeah, citizens, uh, yeah, multiculturally yeah, oriented and sensitive, but we do resist uh, with a variety of creative forms. Yeah, thanks so much, Anna. Um, I just want to remind the audience now we're switching to Q and A, so there is the opportunity there if you want to put a specific question to a specific speaker or if you want to address a question to the panel in general, uh, you're very free to do so. And I have a number of questions that have come in already, uh, beginning with my colleague, Professor Claire Hamilton from the uh, Law Department. Claire asks, um, many thanks, she says, for the fascinating talks. I would be very interested in the panelists' views on the role of human rights in countering the far right. Uh, it's interesting that sometimes radical right parties appropriate or co-opt uh, rights discourses to support their positions. So I wonder um, who wants to come back in on that, perhaps Simone or Aaron this time. Uh, where is the place of human rights in all of this discussion, Simone. I think human rights are a very important topic uh, for countering the, the far right because uh, this is what they are acting against uh, if you think it to the end, um, the equality of all people. But I think I know what you are looking at and we see this, um, the strategies uh, on the far right and or racist um, parts of society or conspiracy ideologists as well in Germany that they try to change um, the view on the victim and the dealer and uh, try, for example, to say that they are the Democrats um, um, giving all, uh, all uh, opinions uh, a place uh, to be uh, asserted. And uh, if a democratic society says, uh, for example, that you are not allowed to deny the Holocaust, then this is a form of censorship and they are the victims, for example. Um, but I think these are discourses which you can counter very easily um, and um, explaining why this is, uh, why this is uh, uh, completely um, bringing up it from the totally wrong way. But I see this as well that they try to frame themselves as uh, really fighters for human rights, even though they, of course, fight against us. Um, I think we should talk about this topic and we, uh, and if I do workshops on the topic, for example, I always encourage people to take a stand on these uh, positions very, um, with a very open heart, because uh, it's easy to counter this. I think Anna has a, a you want to something as well. Respond to that, yes. Uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm speaking uh, from the premises of a uh, um, European MA on human rights, so that I, <laughs> I feel obliged in a way to, to react. Uh, but uh, uh, um, I'll do it uh, really uh, in a more analytical, not normative, uh, not normative sense. I would say uh, uh, that uh, uh, far-right populists uh, are very skillful uh, using, uh, uh, let's say, the human rights uh, uh, argument. Uh, so, for instance, for Muslim women, so we fight for their rights, uh, etc. And I, I would agree for uh, for uh, for that. Uh, uh, and uh, what I can uh, say, we have to be uh, how to say analytical when we analyze, uh, when we study, research, let's say this uh, this phenomena. There are two concepts uh, uh, which correspond to two realities. So one is this exclusive intersectionality. And uh, uh, so uh, the far right, um, okay, politicians and leaders, etc., they are extremely efficient 
in this exclusive intersectionality. So mixing gender, rights, class, religion, nationality, etc., for this package of exclusion, of inequality, of solidarity only with the, uh, the okay, the ethnic, uh, uh, let's say, co-nationals, et cetera, et cetera. So from the other side, there is the idea of inclusive intersectionality, but we have to be self-critical and to say mm -hmm. that very often, uh, let's say also human rights and the civic activists, they are divided. They are LGBT NGOs, they are gender, let's say, uh, LGO, uh, NGOs, they are, are pro-migrant NGOs, etc. And they are much less united in creating this uh, mix, intersectionally positive, inclusive mix, than, uh, 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 let's say, the far right uh, yeah, politicians who are extremely efficient and are not divided at all so that they fight the LGBT, they fight uh, what they call, let's say it does not exist, but they call it gender ideology, et cetera, et cetera. So that we have to be aware so that this is, and uh, if Simon uh, uh, allows me, I would say that also uh, another, uh, 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 let's say venue or another field where the far right is much stronger than civic activism, it is the online space. Mm -hmm. It is the online space. And they, this they dominate, term. they dominate, and the civic activists, okay, so that they try to create some alternatives which are uncomparably weaker than this domination because of several reasons, you know, better than me, less regulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But okay, so in a debate, we have to, okay to be not only normative but especially uh, uh, analytical. So. Uh, yes, this is a perfect segue. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, <clears throat> to um, Aaron, if I could, it's about the asymmetry uh, in respect of visibility and presence that Anna has just described between far iterations of the far right, organized and otherwise, and civic activists on the other side. So the question is from Eleanor Brooks of the Crosscare Migrant Project. Um, um, Eleanor asks, who decides what constitutes hate speech or misinformation? And is it appropriate for the tech giants to define this? And additionally, in respect of the human moderators that are employed by the big tech uh, companies rather than AI, what is the impact on their mental health? So Aaron, perhaps you would address that that, that question of asymmetry and again the role of the tech giants. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in some ways, if you don't mind, I can sort of segue, like bring it back from the human rights issue. Because I think in some sense, like we need to define what we're talking about. Because human rights, I mean, we're not just talking about rights, we're talking about human rights. And for the most part, we have in a case like in this country with Brexit, they're against the European human rights. And they're, it's part of a, a anti EU discourse. But actually, the the sort of intellectual vanguard of the far right believes in universal human, human rights because they're against what they call identity politics. And so they're against rights, they're against civil rights for, for disenfranchised, historically powerless or um, disenfranchised groups, right? So in sense, human rights, is it's not just a, it, it, there's a, 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 a strategic, but also for them, a sort of like a, a logical kind of um, mix and match, if you will. Um, I think the, I think, and the reason I mentioned that is because I think that's where we get into the historical imbalance. And when, when you have far right actors talking about rights that they like, you know, it's often on, not, it's on the back of rights fought for and perceived to be achieved by historically marginalized groups. So what they do in some sort of like narrative kind of inversion or conspiracy theory, they argue that these organizations already, or these communities already have the power and thus we are now lost it. Because everyone knows that, you know, in, in race, gender and sexuality for the far right, it's a zero sum game. 
Um, and they, they have no notion that they were ever powerful. It was just nor it was just naturalized completely and grievance ridden. Um, but what they end up doing is say these these rights arguments now pass to us. As does the victimization that we are not responsible for. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's it's a little bit of a sort of like you know it's a uh, a well worn little kind of diorama of positionality, right, for them. But I think what's important to note is that these that these power imbalances exist fundamentally. I mean, the reason why these NGOs that represent marginalized groups and disenfranchised groups also struggle both online and in the political sphere is because the far right often represent the actual interests of the powerful, even if they are poor, because their, in, their interest still may be in capitalism, but it is definitely in patriarchy and white supremacy. And so in a sense, they also have in the frontier of social media have captured a form of kind of like frontier pol grievance politics that speaks loudly and serves the moneyed and ideological interests of many of these platforms. And so get more airtime. The irony being is that they may get more airtime and more attention. Their representation of reality is more sedimented and, and accepted cancel culture, woke, you know, every university is woke, cancel, people are quitting their jobs and claiming they're canceled. It's, it's unbelievable how like completely made up this is, how completely false it is. Uh, but it keeps on working because they rep, it, it, it gets the dollars, pounds, whatever currency, and it also gets the attention, it's clickbait, it fits with the ideological, um, positions of many of the broadsheets and tabloids. And I think the focus on the online, we have to remember that for the most part, the politicians are still responding to the broadsheets. People are still reading the broadsheets and the tabloids and they're hearing this and they're, and they're actually thinking this is more legitimate. They're going, well, this isn't the wild west of social media. This is actually the, you know, the sun, the daily mail, the telegraph, whatever, right? And, and I think what's end, what ends up happening is, is that you, you end up more deeply disenfranchising the NGOs that work for marginalized groups for two reasons, for three reasons. One, it's this amplification and this ideological alignment. The second is we've got austerity, pandemic, you know, et cetera, crises, civil wars, which is actually increasing the need. And then you have the representation that serves establishment elite interests that says, these groups, these communities already run everything. We have to take more back and give to these groups. And I think these kind of alignments in this current kind of like social media, but also, you know, um, physical kind of landscape um, are really holding sway. And I think, I guess I would wonder, you know, is social media the big problem when, when politicians are allowing people to die in the Mediterranean, the channel, et cetera. You know, I mean, I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, mainstreaming the far right, the reason I, I like to de-emphasize the far right is because it's not the far right who are letting people, masses die and drown, who are not, are not creating and re-upping Fortress Europe, Fortress Britain, Fortress America, and deporting people and separating families and, and children. So uh, I, I think that's partly where I'm going with, with, with that. But I think in terms of the mental health, um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, um, but I do know as a researcher of the far right who reads horrible things, including about my own community, um, you know, it, it's, I can't imagine doing it day in, day out and having, having to kind of that being my full-time job, even though it's like, you know, my research job. But um, it, it, it's terrible, but it's also, I don't think, we can trust these platforms to basically hire police, et cetera. Um, they have too many interests which are counter to that. Yeah. Um, and they're putting their workforce at, at, at risk. And I say this also as someone who's worried about labor rights and people. Yeah. And as you rightly point out, the Brexit referendum wasn't won on Facebook alone, although Cambridge Analytica and that whole scandal uh, speaks to an important part of that truth. But in, there were decades of act activism by those newspapers that you mentioned, 
mm. unrelentingly xenophobic, which yeah. paves the way for everything happened. And it is mainstream politicians who've been talking about putting up fences around Lithuania to keep yeah. migrants uh, out there. And of course, Anna, we've seen this in Bulgaria in 2015, uh, mm. similarly. Um, I just wanted, because Aaron, you mentioned it, to, to come back to the pandemic. And I just wonder how much has the pandemic changed everything um, from the perspective of the far right? Has it created new openings, new opportunities that may be exploited in the near future? Or does this kind of depend on how governments respond to the pandemic? I mean, there is evidence that the neoliberal era may be over and governments have um, been spending money hand over fist to try and keep people in employment and so forth. Um, but is that likely to continue? And if, it, if we revert back to the sort of patterns of the past 30 years, does that inevitably mean more progress for the far right or across a whole swathe of jurisdictions in Europe? Perhaps, Anna, I'll come back to you on this one first. Uh, yeah, again, we have to separate uh, uh, electoral, uh, let's say, results and success of the far right uh, uh, and impact uh, of the far right uh, uh, on uh, politics and uh, uh, society. Uh, uh, so that uh, um, pandemic does not uh, yeah, bring, uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, too, 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 too many yeah, uh, uh, voters, uh, let's say, to the far right, uh, especially not uh, not in my country, despite the fact that, uh, okay, so probably if we elect a vote uh, one parliament after another, they will get again uh, a far right uh, presentation. But the impact of uh, the way, let's say, they conceive uh, problems uh, uh, so that uh, uh, it is huge. And uh, really, uh, especially, let's say, uh, in, uh, uh, in my country, I do not see authoritative, let's say, voices countering, let's say, this, uh, 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 let's say, these discourses. For instance, let's say, to, to, to quote, um, so far right leader on a, uh, on a TV show. So have you been vaccinated? Yes, because yeah, I was sick and I vaccinated. Would you, let's say, invite your voters uh, to vaccinate? No, uh, uh, because we spoke of uh, human rights. It is uh, an individual right, uh, let's say, and it is, of course, let's say, for a free decision, informed decision, etc., cetera, et cetera, and so that they do not bring, uh, let's say, information for this informed decision, uh, but uh, uh, they really de uh, uh, okay, destabilize uh, any policy, uh, uh, let's say, for, uh, uh, for, va uh, for vaccination. So what is the antibody, what is the anti-strategy for a political scene where politicians, not far right, mainstream politicians, do not dare going openly against the far right topics and, let's say, uh, frames, what is the antibodies and the strategies for media which understand media pluralism in the way, okay, one doctor and uh, uh, one anti-vaxxer. And so that at every moment you have two confronting discourses, people do not listen because, okay, so everything goes. And, uh, uh, and also, let's say, one of the most prominent, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, public, let's say, speaker against the vaccine is uh, a toxicologist in my country uh, uh, and uh, uh, somebody who speaks against the vaccines, but who gets governmental funding for create a Bulgarian vaccine. Okay, so we are the country of overproduction of paradoxes so that we transform everything so that it's very interesting to live in, uh, but uh, okay, not, not easy to, 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 to live in so that probably next debate should be not far right, uh, but uh, uh, let's say what I said, or far right topics without the far right, because in several countries, in several countries from, let's say, Brexit to the Bulgarian uh, case, okay, what I see is this, this hegemonization of the far right discourses without 
necessarily strong or any far right political actors. Yes, but the I discourses are there, the frames are there, the public opinion has been changed accordingly, accordingly. Yeah, and as, as you point out, um, Anna, um, actually it's not even the mainstream right that has taken up these tropes. It's sometimes the center left parties in Denmark, for example, uh, the Social Democrats, a very, very good example of this. Bulgarian uh, Socialist Party is as far right <laughs> as the far right. It's the most conservative progressive party I know, I'm sure. Is it progressive? It is the most conservative. That's, yeah, uh, okay, that's it. Yeah. Incredible, incredible. So in what is the alternative? So that left voters who support far right frames. Uh, again, Simone, would you like to come back here and perhaps have a final say? I'm conscious that we are coming up to time and some of our speakers have other commitments. So, Simone, just to you, um, from your vantage point in Germany, um, um, how does it look to you? Um, the situation, I, I can understand everything Anna was uh, saying, but I would say in Germany it was a little bit different because you had this big um, protest movements of uh, pandemic deniers on the streets. Um, these people were not, um, they were not uh, beforehand all supporters of the far right or of right populist parties. This is uh, accordingly to the things Anna said, but we saw a strong movement in, within the far right to occupy those protests. So um, far right activists, very openly far, uh, far right activists indeed, were coming to these demonstrations, trying to um, get contact to the leaders, and the leaders were totally fine with it. Uh, so we saw that these demonstrations, which uh, at the beginning were just a protest uh, of uh, people believing in conspiracy ideologies and just trying to deny the pandemic to feel better, that they were used um, and infiltrated by far-right actors. And of course, uh, this had an impact. So you could see that from this first um, acts of, I just want to criticize that I'm unhappy with the situation or that I'm unsure if the, if the measures the um, government is taking are really correct in a pandemic situation. This was a starting point. We really, uh, they re radicalized very fast into um, completely conspiracy ideologies with uh, always claiming that the Jews have invented the virus and uh, the government could not be trusted anymore and things like that. But still, even if uh, there was big movements on the street, this was a loud, uh, but still a minority in Germany. So um, we saw a lot of those things. Anna said, uh, um, we didn't see it. Uh, all rep representatives of the government are speaking out for, um, for uh, science, are speaking out for, va for vaccinations. Uh, we didn't have a lot of prominent actors um, who were talking against this, uh, um, being polite, being um, watchful how people can, can come together and how to protect the ones who are affected most by the uh, by the coronavirus. So the, the general um, mood was some, was totally different. Uh, even though we still have to work with this, uh, people going into delusional conspiracy worlds within the pandemic, um, this will still be a topic in Germany as well. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think we are going to have to bring the proceedings to a close, regrettably. Um, it's been a really wonderfully rich, fruitful and heterogeneous conversation. And I'm extremely grateful to our four speakers for your time and for your really valuable insights this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Barry Cannon for asking me to host this event and to the Irish Research Council and Crosscare for their sponsorship of this particular project that um, these events are nested into, Stop the Far Right. And finally, to thank our colleagues at the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute, who um, always provide extraordinary help to us, administrative and otherwise technical especially in organizing these events and ensuring that they go off without a hitch. So thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Aaron and Simone. And thank you to everybody who has joined in this afternoon. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks.